Good evening, everybody. Welcome along. Welcome, welcome. We're just going to let everyone join us. Good evening. Good evening, everybody. If you're just joining us, see people flooding into the webinar this evening. Good news. Good evening. Welcome if you're just joining us. We're just waiting for a few seconds to let everyone come in. Mm -hmm. Hi there, good evening. Still just letting everyone join us. Welcome if you've just popped in. Okie doke. I think the numbers are just slowing down a little bit, so I think we'll crack on and let everyone else catch up with us as we as we get started. So good evening, everybody, and welcome, a very warm welcome to the Nature Trek Roadshow. Um, this is the 14th Roadshow now in our winter series. Um, this is now part of our extended programme by popular demand. So if you asked for us to speak on this destination this evening, thank you, and here we are again. We have about 330 of you signed up to join us this evening. That's households. So that's fantastic. Thanks for joining us. My name is Kerry Porteous. I'm your host this evening and I'm an operations manager in the Next Trek office. I've been with Next Trek for about eight years now and look after a plethora of destinations, but I'm not going to be talking about any of them tonight. I'm going to be letting my lovely colleagues and tour leaders do that for me. So normally in the winter, we'd be out on the road visiting you in person in different venues around the country. And of course, we're not able to do that this year, but it's been really marvellous to take our roadshow online instead. And we've reached a lot of you this way. Um, I said, in fact, they've been so popular, our webinars, that we've extended our talks through to the end of March now, covering lots of different destinations. If there's still a destination that we haven't covered yet that you'd like us to, by all means, just let us know because it'll shape our plans for the future and we've got lots of places that we'd still like to talk about. So you can always contact us, info at naturetrek.co.uk and just let us know what you'd like to hear about next. Um, so if anyone is new to Zoom this evening, if this is the first time you've joined us, then please don't worry, we cannot see or hear you. So you can go around, you can pot off, make a cup of tea if you need to, that's not a problem at all. Just us panellists here in the spotlight tonight. There is a chat function, which we'd love you to use. Um, you can send messages just to the panellists, or you can include all attendees as well. Um, it's lovely if you do want to include all attendees, if there's something you'd like to say that others might be interested to hear as well, um, then just include them as well. We'd just say, um, apparently it can get a bit distracting if you're on an iPad um, and messages are flashing up during a talk. If that's happening to you, you can mute the chat function and then just look at it again in the, in the interval or after when we come to the Q&A section at the end. So by all means go for it, but um, yeah, if it's annoying you, then there's a little bell icon and you can mute it. We also have a question and answer function. Um, that's the best place to be asking questions for this evening. And we'd encourage you to ask any questions at all that you have, whether it's about one of the talks you've just heard, one of the destinations, somewhere else, um, about travel in general, then by all means, just pop the questions in the Q&A box if you do that rather than the chat, then that means you can actually keep track of them much more easily. We'll type some answers out during the evening um, and we'll wrap up any that we haven't got round to by that point at the end. And we'll read out a few as well that we think others might be interested to hear answers to as well. So that'll be just after the last talk, just after nine o'clock. Um, if you're on our mailing list, then in the last couple of weeks, you should have received a big shiny brochure from us. So we hope you've enjoyed thumbing through it and thinking about um, where you'd like to go next once we're all able to travel again and doing some, some dreaming. Um, if you haven't received a brochure and you'd like to join our mailing list, then again, just, just drop us an email, let us know, um, and we'll get one out to you in the post. If you think you are on our mailing list and haven't got a brochure yet, then you probably should have got it by now. So again, just, just get in touch and we'll see what's going on there. Um, so tonight we are heading to the Far East, a fantastic place full of different cultures, different peoples, um, amazing culture, amazing wildlife. So I'm very excited that we're going to be taking there this evening. I'm joined by two of my colleagues from the office, Paul and Matt, who are both speaking after the break. And the first half, I'm delighted to be joined by two of our esteemed tour leaders. So we have Neil and we have Tim. 
And together we're going to go to China, Cambodia, Thailand, Taiwan and Japan. Um, so without any further ado, I'm going to hand over to Tim, who's going to kick off the evening talking to us all about China. Thank you, Tim. Over to you. Okay. Uh, thanks very much, Kerry. Um, so I'm Tim Melling. I've been uh, Nature Trek tour leading for over 20 years. I started in the late 1990s. I've led to many, many places over all that uh, uh, period of time, but I tend to specialise in the cold places, uh, the Arctic and the Antarctic, if I can. So, uh, but today I'm going to talk to you about another quite cold place, which is China in uh, winter. So uh, here we go. So, uh, uh, wild China, Sichuan's birds and mammals. Now, if uh, many of you will have been on uh, uh, some fantastic uh, trips and will have uh, photographed some uh, iconic wildlife, but if you look on the internet, uh, at the things that you've photographed, whether it be blue whales or polar bears or lions or tigers, you'll find that hundreds of other people have also been and taken photographs. Whereas China gives you a chance to do something uh, a little bit more pioneering you will see things that there aren't that many pictures of on the internet and some things there are just virtually none so uh, you really really will be um, uh, you know uh, treading new ground here so uh, Sichuan um, um, oops, sorry. Uh, Sichuan. It's um, uh, it looks quite small on a uh, on a map of China. Uh, you see it took down there, and it looks like a rather large county uh, compared to England. But Sichuan itself is about twice the land, or more than twice the land area of Great Britain. It's uh, um, you know, so it really is a massive place. And China has a reputation for being very developed and uh, and uh, and is developing all the time. But Sichuan has remained mercifully less affected than most other provinces because it's uh, it's so mountainous and, and uh, difficult to develop, uh, as I'm hoping that you'll see. Uh, we have four main bases uh, on, on this trip, which is uh, focused on birds and mammals. And I'm going to take you through each of those four main places and talk about the kind of things that we uh, see there. So uh, the first thing, I uh, the first place is Labaha, uh, which is about 3,000 metres above sea level and um, for comparison I've just given you Ben Nevis there one three four five so we're talking uh, well above uh, twice the height of Ben Nevis and you can see it's forested at that altitude and it's cloud forest as well and the thing that we're looking for here is red pandas that's the, the, the main target now, red pandas, like giant pandas, eat bamboo, and uh, what, uh, and you can see that the forests there have a, an understory of bamboo, and uh, these red pandas uh, wander around in the bamboo thickets, eating bamboo, not showing themselves, and can be really fiendishly difficult to see. But uh, for a few weeks in the autumn, they're tempted out of the bamboo, up the trees to feed on fruit and berries and things like that. And if you time it just right, the leaves will have fallen off the trees for the winter, but the fruit remains. And so you can then actually see them in, uh, in, in trees. That, that's the, the, uh, the, the trick. Now, the very first time I went there, uh, we went up to Labaha into this cloud forest and we stayed there for many hours, about five hours. And I think we had the briefest glimpse of red panda uh, disappearing into the uh, tree, uh, into the bamboo from a tree, and not everybody saw it. And uh, when that was over, uh, I said to our local guide, Sid, well, what do we do now? And he said, well, he said, red pandas can sometimes be difficult. So uh, that's why I always schedule two days at Labaha so that it gives us a sporting chance. So I said, well, where do we go tomorrow? And he said, oh, same place, uh, no problem. So uh, I was a little bit worried about this. But anyway, we went there, same place, and wandered into the uh, uh, there. And one of the first things we saw was this distant red panda. You can see it there, just right in the middle of the screen. And it was uh, uh, clambering around in the high branches. So anyway, we were very excited. We all got the telescopes out and had really good telescope views of it. But cloud forest being cloud forest, the cloud came down. And uh, you can still see it there, just right of centre. But then the cloud came down completely and totally obscured the view. And then, as the cloud lifted again, the red panda had totally disappeared. 
Now, by this time, uh, it's cold weather and I'd had several cups of tea with my breakfast and I was in desperate need for a comfort break. So I told everybody to keep scanning the trees whilst I just uh, uh, went to find somewhere quiet. And I wandered off the road and found myself a little glade, wandered in there and there looking at me from the tree just a few feet above me was a really close red panda. So without even starting, I then backed slowly out, brought everybody around into this thing and everybody got stupendous views of, of a closed red panda our second of the day and during the time that we were up there in the same place as before we must have seen about uh, uh, a good half dozen red pandas there it was an uh, absolutely fantastic time uh, there's another one uh, sitting in the middle of the um, uh, of, of a berry tree without any leaves that's actually the Ch Chinese crab apple that they feed on even though it's red that's uh, it, it is a, a malus species and uh, sometimes when they've uh, exhausted all the fruit in a tree they have to go and find another fruit tree and sometimes if you're very very lucky you can catch them on the ground as well and here was one uh, wandering around on the uh, uh, the ground in between uh, uh, berry trees um, uh, Labaha is also, uh, we, we go onto the tops of the mountains for the, uh, there, but down in the steep sided valley, there's a lovely river with a, uh, a road that runs alongside it. And we go down here at night with lamps looking for some of the special wildlife that's down here. And it's birds and wildlife, may, mainly mammals, but uh, uh, one of the things is the tawny fish owl. So this isn't the brown fish owl or the buffy fish owl that you can get in places like Turkey and India, those two. This is the tawny fish owl, much, much more sought after and more difficult to see. And um, uh, also flying squirrels. Uh, the one in the bottom left is the red and white flying squirrel. That's actually a relatively easy one. Uh, we see large numbers of those and they're e fairly easy to see in various places in Southeast Asia. But the one on the right, the main picture, you can see the, the flying squirrel flat between its legs. That is called the complex toothed flying squirrel. That was named by a museum man if ever I uh, um, <laughs> found a species that was. And um, it's the complex toothed flying squirrel. Again, if you look on the internet, there are hardly any photographs of this. Um, this is the Chinese cerro. Uh, the Chinese cerro is a, um, a kind of goat antelope and it's very, very shy and lives high up on the forested mountains during the day. But in the evenings, it comes right down to find its favourite foods to feed on. And if you look here, you can see one of its hooves has found this favoured sapling and it's pressed the, the tree down so that it actually reaches uh, um, mouth level so that it can uh, get there. But it's a, again, a very highly sought after species. Um, and this one's a Chinese leopard cat as well. I photographed this one from the car. Just uh, it was uh, up in a tree looking for birds at night and just came down and uh, managed to uh, uh, get a good photograph of that. So and Siberian weasel, that's another species. You know, this was just lamping there. I saw a tiny little bit of eye shine during the uh, uh, one of the evening sessions. And there it was hopping around. All these photographs, by the way, were taken by me on these trips. So, you know, they're not agency photographs or anything like that. That's why it's a little bit grainy, because it was taken by torchlight at night. Uh, not all the mammals are nocturnal. This is the huge Tibetan macaque, which is quite common up there. The chunkiest macaque on the planet, a real bruiser of a thing, but uh, you see lots of those at Labaha. Um, and uh, some of the birds as well. Now, uh, Sichuan tree creeper, you might think, oh, that's uh, ten a penny. But this bird was only discovered new to science in 1995 and was described officially as recently as 2002. Um, and it's not just a taxonomy split. This is a completely different species. It's much shorter build than any other tree creeper and has a completely different song and vocalizations. And again, we see them every time we go there. It's got a really limited uh, world distribution just in a few valleys in Sichuan and uh, one of them's at Labaha where we go. Uh, that's another species that again rarely features in uh, 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 when you look on the internet. This is Pear David's tit. Uh, it's a relative of the willow tit, but it's all fiery orange underneath and a much bigger black throat there. Uh, Chinese nutcracker. Uh, that's actually been taxonomically split now from the nutcracker that occasionally appears in Britain. It's, uh, you can see, it looks like it's got a magnet on top of its head and all the white spots have been sucked up towards it. So it has none of the usual white spots in the lower part of its uh, brown body. 
And uh, this is the uh, hotel that we stay at at Labaha. Like many of the places, they're actually quite palatial and seem a bit over the top for these uh, remote rural locations that we're at. But uh, it's built of marble, really shiny walls. But the main reason I've put this on is that each of the three trips that I've led to Labaha, we've seen a bird uh, a wandering round, actually on the hotel itself, on the windowsills, catching moths and things like that. And this bird is so sought after in Europe that Nature Track even do special little trips just to see this bird. It's the main focus. And that's wall creeper. Uh, you can see there's one they're flying there. You can see over the shiny marble hotel, and that's one just per perched on on the hotel uh, veranda there. But it's uh, you know am amazing to think that a bird that you know most people would really really love to see is just like a common garden bird in uh, in, in China. Uh, the next location is Balang Mountain. Uh, this is the highest altitude that we reach in China, and that's 4,600 meters. Uh, remember, 1345 is Ben Nevis, but we're talking uh, more than three times the, uh, the height of Ben Nevis here. And um, it's, uh, there's a phenomenon there that is, no, that is so frequent that it's, uh, it, it even has a name. That sea of fog there is known as the Balang Cloud Ocean. And we stay in the valley, much, much lower altitude than this. And as we drive up, it's usually thick fog. And then all of a sudden you come out of it and it's uh, blazing sunshine and blue skies at the top there. And uh, then we uh, and we can continue right on to the uh, to the very top of the uh, mountain where there is. Um, uh, it, it looks like it's straight off top gear that road. You can see the cloud ocean in the background and that's taking us right up to the summit. Um, on the way up, we sometimes see uh, uh, interesting pheasants. Uh, these are the Chinese Manal pheasants with their electric blue backs and green heads and copper uh, uh, necks. Again, another highly restricted world distribution. Very, very rare and difficult to see. But uh, this last time we saw lots of them. Um, we, we see things like white-eared pheasants and blue-eared pheasants on this same road. But the Chinese Manal is the real um, uh, prize. It's so little known that when I looked in pheasants and partridges of the world, it didn't. E it said that the display has never been described. They don't know what the display is like. And I looked on the internet, I typed in all the things I could and could not find a single photograph of one displaying. But we had this one displaying on the road in front of us and it fanned out its wings and its tail. So it was like a giant dinner plate and it was jumping up and rocking backwards and forwards as if it was on a pivot uh, right in front to try and impress the ladies. So that is a very rare photograph. I don't know anybody else that's ever managed to photograph a Chinese manal in full display there. Anyway, continuing, this is on the way up. When you get to the top, it's all kind of alpine birds, uh, 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 high, uh, high altitude birds. Like this is the Tibetan snowcock and we get snow partridges up there. And uh, that's an alpine accenter. You get alpine chuffs, you get common chuffs as well. Uh, uh, things like golden shats, red star, that's a golden eagle. See lots of golden eagles on this trip, lots of different kinds of eagles, but uh, golden eagles are uh, quite a common feature. And then when you get to the very top, uh, this is where we start looking for blue sheep, uh, uh, which is um, uh, about the only really special mammal that we usually see. Uh, you can just see there, uh, 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 lower left on the front there, that's a couple of blue sheep at the uh, near the summit of Balang Mountain. They're not actually blue at all, they're a sort of a grey-brown colour, but and they look more like goats as well. <laughs> disappointment on disappointment, isn't it? But there is, uh, you know, they do occur there, and they're also the favoured prey of snow leopards, which also apparently occur in this area, but I've never been lucky enough to, uh, to glimpse one of those. So um, uh, going down on the way down, uh, there were sort of thousands of birds on the pylon wires uh, uh, there, and they were really timid. They were uh, festooning all of the pylons and the wires, and then they would descend onto the sea buckthorn trees uh, to feed on the orange berries there, and then something would spook them, and the whole lot would come up again, like a, a giant um, group of uh, waxwings or starlings. And when we got close, we found out that this was another highly sought after bird. This is the amazing Grandala electric blue with black wings and a black tail and these birds only breed in the absolute highest mountains of the Himalayas way above the snow line but in winter they form flocks uh, nomadic flocks and if you're lucky enough to coincide with one of these flocks you can get absolutely brilliant views as they come down to feed on the sea buckthorn and the sea buckthorn is the same sea buckthorn that we have in Britain except it doesn't occur by the sea in China it's a it's a mountain plant 
Um, this is the Chivalski's Nuthatch, the same person who had the Chivalski's Wild Horse named after him. Uh, on one of my trips to China, I had a, a, a huge lister uh, of, of birds and mammals. He'd seen over 9,000 species of birds on the planet, and there are only about 10,000 on the list. And he had a list of about 20 birds that he was desperate for me to find for him here. And one of these was Chivalski's Nuthatch, which I managed to find very easily, as we have each time. So it, it was a a very happy man after that, um, uh, which is a very handsome nuthatch, as I'm sure you'll agree, but there are also other fantastic looking birds there. This is one of my favourite birds. It's the Sevatov's tip warbler. They sometimes call it the white browed tip warbler as well, but it looks like a, a lilac breasted roller, but it's in miniature. It's only the size of a blue tit, uh, a really full of charisma and, uh, and, and a real uh, wonderful songster. And we also get crested tip warblers there as, uh, as well. Uh, which is the only other species of uh, tip wobbler on the planet. Uh, on to the uh, next uh, uh, place. This is the Tibetan Plateau at Ruragai, uh, 3,500 metres, absolutely above the tree line here. And each trip we've done, I've managed to get really good views of wolves here. Uh, and this is the Chinese mountain cat. This is another species that there's hardly any decent photographs of on the internet. Even on Wikipedia, they've got a captive one in a concrete barred zoo. They haven't, there's hardly any photographs of them in the wild, but we've seen them on every single one of my trips. They've got a, an ear tuft like a, a lynx, but it shows better here because this was taken at night. Uh, on the shadow, you can see the shadow of its ear has got the tuft, but uh, if you'll see, so that's Chinese mountain cat. Um, this is Hume's ground tit. This was a, a real puzzling bird for the taxonomist because they thought it was the smallest crow on the planet. They thought it was one of the ground jays and they called it Hume's ground jay. But when they've looked at its DNA, they found it's actually one of the tits and its closest living relative is actually the great tit, even though it looks nothing like it. Um, lots and lots of snow finches up there on the plateau and other food, which means that there's lots of raptors, there's upland buzzards, uh, merlins, look how cold it is there with the horizontal icicles on the little uh, fence post there. Uh, hen harriers are a very, very common sight up there. We see multiples of those each time. Step eagles, again, very, very common. Uh, and many of these are feeding on the pikers. These are plateau pikers. They, they don't hibernate, they stay active. Even at that altitude in the middle of winter, uh, they come out feeding on the little scraps of vegetation and uh, that's what most of the birds are, are feeding on the birds of prey and as uh, you can see here uh, saker falcons they feed on them as well saker falcons are again a common bird we will see multiples of them up at Ruragai. Uh, uh, vultures that happens to be a lamagai but we also see black and himalayan griffin vultures there uh, tibetan gazelles that's the other thing that the vultures feed on when they happen to die but uh, and also they feed on yaks and there's certainly plenty of those tibetan foxes we always get as well on the plateau. That always reminds me of somebody that's coming home from a party uh, with his uh, dicky bow sort of uh, undone around his neck there. And uh, Palace's cat as well. It looks like Bagpuss, doesn't it? Really big, chunky cat. Uh, but again, we've seen that on uh, 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 at Ruragai uh, several times. Uh, these are the... Uh, 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 we often get blizzards up there because it is such high altitude. And I love the Chinese signs. There's one here that says Zoology Channel. Channels. And what that the translation of that means is this is where yaks tend to cross. And uh, some of the notices there that they have are almost clairvoyant. I mean, how do they know it's foul weather slow down? <laughs> it's uh, and um, when when we come off the plateau going to the next venue, because it's such steep, steep sided valleys, you sometimes get rock falls which block a road. But the Chinese being the Chinese, just get a JCB up there, bulldoze the way through it and create a new road. But they have uh, a, a very amusing warning signs here. Uh, who knows, your mother may have even given you this same advice yourself, but look out, watch out for the rolling stones. <laughs> That's brilliant. Uh, and on to the final venue, and this is Tangjiha, which is a much lower altitude. Uh, here you get the garden birds here are things like the wonderful red-billed blue magpie. Uh, look at that, the graduated tail as it flies into a tree. These are common garden birds there. That bird looks like it was designed by a cartoonist. Black chin tip, one of my favourites there. Uh, white cap water red star, really common. You get them wherever you get rivers in Sichuan. Very, very common. These are a little scarcer. Uh, the, the little fork tail. Fork 
foxtails are a group of a small number of birds that are only found in uh, uh, Southeast Asia. The little foxtail has only got a body size as big as a, a pied wagtail, but you get other foxtails as well, including the white crowned, and this is the emblem of the Oriental Bird Club, as you'll know if you've got uh, uh, and uh, if you've got any of their uh, merchandise or literature. Um, uh, crested kingfisher as well. That's one of the four huge kingfishers on the planet, uh, uh, common on the rivers at uh, at Tangjia. And uh, again, the Chinese signs: wildebeest come out at night because they don't have a word for what they call wildebeests in uh, in English. That's the nearest they could get. But what they are is golden tackins or Sichuan tackins because it's had a taxonomic split. These are huge muskox-tized um, uh, sheep relatives. Uh, and again, they're very shy. They stay in the woods, but in in the evenings they come down to the roadsides to feed and at night and so by going out in the evenings we can usually get really good close views of these rare animals again that uh, there aren't that many photographs of. Uh, we see badgers each time we're there, uh, uh, three species of badger, that's the hog badger uh, and, um, and finally the uh, Asiatic golden monkey, the, the golden snub-nosed monkey. If you watch the uh, Philip Pullman's uh, His Dark Materials um, uh, dramatization, this is what Mrs. Coulter used as the, uh, as her, had as a demon uh, there. But they're actually very rare and elusive, very difficult to find, but we do usually find them. And uh, they're well worth the, uh, the, the trouble of finding them. They're a real prize. And uh, finally, uh, as the little uh, Tibetan macaque uh, waves goodbye, um, we, we had on the first trip, 41 species of mammal. That's three species of cats, three dogs, three badgers and red panda, plus 170 species of bird. And I remember, Paul Stanbury saying to me that you normally have to go to somewhere like sub-Saharan Africa to see that number of uh, mammals uh, anywhere. So uh, what a special place China is. Okay, thanks very much. Hello, I hope you can all hear me. Uh, this is Neil Mountmahan. I'm um, uh, calling in to, uh, into you all the way from the middle of England in Northamptonshire, a very cold day here, as it is probably where you are as well. Uh, thanks to Tim from a fantastic um, uh, show there. And from one very cold place in the world, I'm taking you now to a very warm and hot place. And uh, I'm gonna take you to Cambodia. <clears throat> and we, the, the Nature Trek tour is called The Best of Cambodia, where we look at birds, mammals and temples. Um, this is uh, Cambodia. Um, so we've got Thailand um, off over here, over to the, over to the, the west, uh, Laos to the north, and uh, Vietnam down, down on the right-hand side there. So we're quite a way south from where Tim was in the, in the province up there. Now then, the idea is that this is a relatively new tour, which we first ran here last year. We managed to run three tours uh, before the inevitable lockdown and all three tours um, really were quite successful. Um, but as you might imagine, whenever we run a new tour to a new country, we're always a little bit um, concerned about how it might go. So the idea is that we have two tours running in 2022, in January and February. And uh, these are 17 day tours where we very much want uh, people to come along and enjoy um, the, the amazing country that uh, Cambodia really is. We fly in from London uh, via Bangkok and then we land, if you can see where my arrow is, in Siem Reap, which, which is a uh, conurbation just here. And this is just above Tonle Sap, uh, which is a large lake, large freshwater lake, which is the largest geographical feature in Cambodia. Now Siem Reap will be our base uh, for the next three or four days. Um, I'm just going to quickly run through the itinerary so you know what to expect on this tour. But as the name suggests, we hope to actually um, involve you in the culture of the country, uh, modern history as well as ancient history going back to the 12th and 13th century. We very much want to see the special birds of this region and there are some real crackers out there. And of course, we're looking at some of the special mammals that are there as well. So the itinerary, uh, we, we spend the first three or four days around Siem Reap. Um, we spend one day, uh, we're actually visiting the uh, Angkor Wat site, which of course is the UNESCO World Heritage Site. Uh, we'll have an opportunity of look at spending a whole day looking at the temples and indeed the, the forests around uh, that area are also um, excellent for wildlife. We then move on um, 
uh, from there, the next day we actually spend some time on Tonley Sap Lake itself. We actually um, get onto a boat just about here and we trundle around and get on some smaller boats here. And this is where we actually um, then start uh, looking at some of the water birds associated with this fantastic area. The main, the main birds to try and find are things like milky stork and great adjutant, really quite rare birds, but also a whole host of other water birds as well. The next two days are taken up um, really looking, uh, going onto the grasslands and the agricultural areas um, just to the east of Tonley Sap in this area around here. And our target then is looking for things like Saras cranes, lots of raptors, and of course the Bengal, the infamous Bengal floricum, which is this small Asiatic bustard. Um, from there, um, we then will actually be, uh, once we then leave CM Riep, uh, which is in our very comfortable hotel, and we, be move, we move off over to uh, this part of uh, where cursor, this part of the area around here, uh, where we're going into some of the diptocarp woodland, which is where some of the other specialities reside, such as giant ibis, which is Cambodia's national bird, and the white-shouldered ibis, and a whole host of, of woodland birds and mammals, including some of the, some of the uh, uh, sought-after primates as well. After that, uh, we'll be looking at another temple area around about here and some fine forest birding as well. And then we take a bit of a hike up here to this area here, up towards the north of Cambodia, where we go to the infamous vulture restaurant, where a lot of effort has been put into trying to ensure that the Asiatic vultures are brought back from the brink. From here, from here we then uh, move down to, uh, down to this area around here. Um, get my cursor to work properly. Here we go, this area here, around uh, Krak uh, Kraki, and uh, here we have, of course, the, the mighty uh, River Mekong. And here we actually hope to have a look at um, one or two delights, including the Inawadi dolphin. Uh, right over the last bit of the tour, the 17 day tour, we spend in this area here, right up against the Vietnamese border, uh, looking at some very special primates and forest birds. And then the last couple of days are in the Phnom Penh area, where again, some more cultural visits, um, looking at the Cambodian tailor bird, which is the, the endemic bird for the, the area, and then we fly home from there. So that's a quick rundown on the, the itinerary. Let's show you some, some pictures of, of Cambodia. And of course, this is the, the famous Angkor Wat complex. Yes, we do share the area with lots of other tourists, but we have an interpretive guide who is able to give us quite a, a good rundown on the history and the culture associated with, with this, this, uh, this temple complex, which is quite amazing. And you can see from the photo, there's some rather special forests all around it. So even once we're looking around the temple, we're still seeing wildlife as well. Uh, moving on, just a couple of kilometers down the road, we visit the Bayon Temple. And if you like inscriptions and engravings, this is probably the place for you. So this really does depict um, life as in the 12th and 13th centuries. Some warlike um, engravings, um, lots of, sort of scriptures uh, associated with the religion of the time, which kept moving from one to the other. Uh, but now Buddhism is the, is the, main, is the main religion that uh, the modern day uh, Cambodians follow. And then we have to, of course, visit uh, Ta Prom, which is where the, the illustrious Tomb Raider film was, was, uh, was filmed uh, with Angela Jolly. And of course, uh, this is where nature is almost fighting back with that amazing tree, the whole variety of trees which are trying to reclaim the area. And these large trees aren't cut down. So as a result, uh, because they're mature trees, they're good for wildlife as well. So we spend a pretty much a full day, our first full day of the itinerary looking around these marvelous temples. And of course, we start looking into some of the, um, some of the primates, so habitualized northern pigtail macaque, uh, the long tail macaque, which is a little bit more frequent. We'll see those quite easily. And the birds, well, they come thick and fast, really, but the rose-breasted parakeet or red-breasted parakeet has two different names. The red-breasted parakeet, if you like, very common parakeet in, uh, in Cambodia, and they nest in holes and trees here. So we'll certainly get some good views of those. They nest alongside Alexandrine parakeets. And the very the sooty headed bulbul, as you might, know, you might know that if you have been to Asia, then the bulbuls um, certainly are everywhere. Um, Tiger flycatcher, quite a, a little plain brown bird, and this is the Asiatic version of our European red-breasted flycatcher, and it's a bird that we'll typically see wherever, wherever we go. But before we leave this area, we, we very much like to see uh, the pileated um, uh, gibbons, if we can. Uh, this is a, a youngster or a female, a coffee-coloured one, and this is the dominant male of the troop. 
and this is a species that was reintroduced to the area in 2012 and now the population seems to be growing steadily and it's one of the easiest places to see uh, an Asiatic gibbon so we'll certainly try very hard to try and see these before we leave the area. Insects abound and we don't always have an awful lot of time to look at the amazing butterflies but any hot place in the world of course has butterflies and moths and similar things in profusion. Crimson sunbird, uh, another little jewel that lives up in the trees and very typical of the small birds and an awful lot of them um, in, the, in the forest around Angra Wat. And of course, uh, we do come across plenty of, um, of dragonflies where the standing water, and this one's a common flange tail, which is quite a sinister looking beast in my opinion. Um, so the first day is over, we move into the second day. We tend to have early starts simply because it is so warm. We want to get the best of the wildlife and the best of our experiences uh, by getting, getting out early. Um, so this is, this is sunrise over Tonley Sap. As I mentioned before, we go out on small boats. Uh, we go past floating villages, which are really amazing. Uh, and then we get into the water birds. And this is uh, an Asian open bill stalk. And we can get really close views of some of these birds. And you may not recognize this, but this is a whisker tern. Uh, winter plumage whisker tern, we're perhaps more familiar with them in the summer plumage. And they, they winter there in their thousands in, on Tonley Sap. Um, another rather special bird of the, of the region is the gray, gray headed uh, fish eagle. And because we are motoring around in boats as locals do, these large eagles and indeed many of the birds pretty much ignore you. So if you're into your photography, there's all sorts of opportunities to take some decent photographs, including an eagle up to point blank range, which is, could be no bad thing. But the water birds do abound. So the Chinese pond heron is a very typical bird of the region. And certainly if you've been to Thailand and places, you'll, you'll be familiar with this. And the intermediate egret is another one that we encounter in good numbers. And we do see some of the more difficult smaller herons, such as uh, yellow bittern, which this is, and sometimes we come across um, the, the chestnut bittern and black bittern as well. Here's a more typical bird that we're all familiar with, which was of course the grey heron, maybe a touch larger and paler out there, but in general it's the same, the same species. Purple heron you'll be familiar with if you are a European bird watcher, but exotic and gorgeous wherever you go in the world. Um, the other big birds we look out for around the Tony Sap area, I mentioned uh, storks, this is a lesser adjutant. Um, it's great, it's, it's big relative is the greater adjutant. This is another lesser adjutant. I haven't got a good picture of a great adjutant, unfortunately. There are just a few breeding pairs there and generally we score with those. Uh, and we'll endeavor to try and get you up looking over uh, some of the uh, stork colonies, which uh, are dominated by this species, the, the painted stork. Uh, but in reality, we'll be looking for the milky stalk, which is a very close relative, but also extremely rare. And this area really gives us the best opportunity in the world to actually see milky stalk. But if we're not looking at a milky stalk, we'll be looking at these gorgeous painted stalks, um, which give, again, very good views. Whilst we're going on in our little boats, we come across things like spot bill pelicans, which do come rather close. Um, and they are very reluctant flyers, so we tend to get very close to them before they do go. A bit of a fuzzy picture of a stalk bill kingfisher. It's a Kingfisher I always find very difficult to photograph, but we do see lots of kingfishers in our, in our, in our travels around Cambodia. And of course, bee eaters are very much a, a gorgeous bird of the region. And these are the rather large terrestrial um, blue tail bee eaters. Good old swallow, it's a barn swallow like ours, except this is the Asiatic race. And these winter in huge numbers around Tonley Sap where there's a ready supply of insects. Also, if you are a bit of a, uh, a bit of a fan of owls, then Cambodia is the place for you. Uh, we have the spotted wood owl, uh, the brown wood owl. Um, if we're fortunate also, we find the collared scops owl as well in various different places. And on average, we get about eight or nine species of owl uh, on our tours, including a couple of uh, really exotic ones as well and hard to see. Um, once we've moved away from Tonley Sap, the next couple of days are looking around some open areas. We hope to see some different species, such as this spotted eagle, which on this occasion was getting harassed by a large bill crow. Uh, we see black winged kites in small numbers, and sometimes we come across imperial eagles and a whole host of other raptors, including eastern marsh harriers and pied harriers. And as I mentioned before, um, Cambodia is a very hot place. So a typical sort of insects of this region is a, is a cicada before and after, uh, and the noise and clamor that goes on with it. And certainly by late morning, it's already getting quite dusty and quite warm on an average day. And we'll be looking for some shelter and some water and some, and some food as well. 
Uh, the first part of the tour, when we're based at um, uh, CM Riep, we basically use air-conditioned coaches to motor around in. But then when we start getting to some serious country, we use 4 by 4s which are Toyota Land Cruisers. And they're all air-conditioned and in, in very comfortable wagons indeed. But even in the open areas where there's small bits of water, we come across things like comb ducks. And the main agriculture of the area um, is, tends to be rice paddies, which is perhaps no great surprise, but also lots of cattle as well. So we'll endeavour to see quite a bit of that. When we moved away from the, the open areas, and hopefully we've seen Saras crane and we've seen Bengal florican and a whole host of other birds and some interesting mammals as well, uh, we get into the, uh, the once flooded diptrocarp woodland. And this is where we come across specialities like chestnut cat bee eater and chestnut tailed uh, starlings and of course the common mine which pretty much occurs in a whole variety of habit habitats normally human related anyway you can see uh, in any way these sort of asiatic countries where it's warm crested serpent and eagles can be found uh, this is a young bird and um, it said that it, about 50 years ago cambodia um, was likened to the asiatic virgin of the serengeti there were so many big mammals out there sadly that's uh, not the case anymore a lot of those those animals died during the the Khmer rouge uh, conflict um, but did, we did come across on one occasion a couple of gaur the big forest cattle uh, which was a big surprise and uh, a big plus for everybody Plenty of reptiles out there as well, not too many snakes, so if you're not a great fan of snakes, we don't see too many snakes, uh, but plenty of reptiles. And some of the mammals we actually like to try and see, uh, this is a, a northern tree shrew that looks quite squirrel-like. Um, and yes, we cheated slightly by putting some rice out on a bird table to, uh, to entice this little chap down. And uh, this is a striped tip babbler and very typical of these sort of the small woodland birds that we encounter in flocks in this sort of uh, this wonderful forest that's full of a variety of birds. And these bird flocks are often headed off by the grey headed um, uh, canary flycatchers. Uh, Tim's already shown us a picture of one of these. Uh, red bill blue magpie, a uh, gorgeous bird, wherever you see it, whatever it's doing. Yes, I cheated again. There's a banana on the bird table, of course, and some rice. But hey, what do you have to do to get a good view of a gaudy bird, eh? Uh, prinias, sort of warble like birds, are in quite good numbers. This is a rufescent prinia, and it's a sort of a bird of a forest edge. And a bit like if you're into your owls, if you're into your woodpeckers, then this is a marvellous place. And this is a very special red bellied woodpecker. Uh, that acts a bit like a sap sucker and drills holes in a tree and then returns a bit later on in order to, to, to drink the sap. But if you like weird and wonderful woodpeckers like the giant great slaty woodpecker, the white bellied woodpecker and a black headed woodpecker, then this is a tour for you because um, anybody who's seen a manic great slaty woodpecker making a hollering noise on top of trees um, will always, always remember that um, episode of life because it's an amazing sight. Anyway, this isn't a woodpecker, this is a rufous winged buzzard, which is a small hawk we see in good numbers around the, around the forests. And um, we'll get our local guys to try and find us some of these ground hugging, um, roosting savannah night jars, which are marvellous things. And as you can see, we sometimes get really, really close to them. Um, how on earth the guys find them, I do not know. I think I must have walked past half a dozen without seeing any at all. But uh, yeah, that's why you use your locals, don't you? Anybody to be concerned about the food by going to Cambodia? It's a very um, bland affair in some respects. If you're used to hot food in Thailand, uh, you'll be happy to know in some respects that uh, Cambodia is a, is a much more um, easy, easy food experience. And if you do want something hot, they put something on the hot uh, separate on the side for you. Um, we found that everybody who came with us, vegetarians and otherwise, um, uh, were looked after very well indeed. And we're very impressed with the catering all the, all the way through the, the three trips we've run so far. A flying flock of spot billed ducks, which uh, are quite nomadic, they'll go wherever the water is. And I haven't had time really to show you much in the way of the butterflies, but this is, this is the clipper, which is like a swallowtail on steroids, really, a marvellous, marvellous beast. Um, I like my reptiles rather, and uh, one of the ones I always like to see is the Tokai gecko, uh, which is a large foot long gecko that, just like the other geckos, comes out in the evening. But just occasionally you can get one in the daytime as well. And vocally they're amazing. I remember the first ones I ever heard I thought were some weird bird sounds. I just couldn't find out what these sounds were, but it's the Tokai, Tokai gecko that's making these weird sounds from, from various parts of trees. Um, the people out there are rather poor, uh, they are lovely people, very unassuming, very polite, 
um, you fall in love with the people as much as you do the country. And uh, but most of them are very poor. And this is a very sort of typical primitive two wheel tractor that they use to get around. It, it's used for everything. Um, and yes, a few wild and woolly locals as well. Um, but you'll, you'll love the people as much as as much as I do. Just occasionally we get lucky and come across some very rare birds. And this is a white winged duck, uh, rather poor photo, but uh, it was at dusk time. And on one of the three tours, we actually managed to get this bird, which was a, a bit of a bit of a special event. Sadly, they're reducing in numbers now and, we, and the chances of seeing them regularly are probably uh, going out the window, but a rather special bird for us on the last trip we did. So moving on from the, uh, the woodland area and having looked at, a, at a, another temple complex at Priya Vihar and the forest around there, uh, we then hope to go to what's called the Vulture Restaurant, which is up here towards the north of the, uh, the country. And here we have the local community and uh, conservation bodies um, actually working very hard um, to try and reverse the decline of the Asiatic vultures by putting uh, cattle out, I might add they are dead cattle, uh, for the vultures to feed on. And here you have the three main species that uh, of, of conservation concern. So you have the uh, so you have the, uh, the red-faced uh, vulture here, slender-billed vulture just here, and then the, the white rump vulture just here. Another picture of uh, two of the species there. Sorry, red-headed red vulture, if I didn't say that right. Um, whilst we're there, we'll see the Asiatic green uh, bee-eaters, which is a bird that turns up just about everywhere in fairly sort of arid areas. And of course, we see some more of these wonderful reptiles, including the, this butterfly lizard, which actually inflates those sacks along the side, if you're lucky, and you see these marvellous colours. The butterflies just abound. Um, if you've been to some of the other countries like Laos, you'll know that um, the butterflies are everywhere. They're absolutely gorgeous. And this is some kind of sort of pansy butterfly, which is all rather pretty. Uh, Diurnal moth, just simply called the yellow moth, we come across these quite regularly as well. Uh, we're moving on rather rapidly. Obviously, I haven't got a great deal of time to talk about the whole country, but uh, moving over to the east, we get to the mighty Mekong River. And it's here that we step, go down these steps that you might see on the picture there into these little boats and we go out onto that, uh, that lovely big broad river. And the, the, the plan is to try and see this little beast, which is the Mekong wagtail, a very special wagtail that only exists around the river Mekong and its tributaries and nowhere else in the world. Might not look particularly special, but it is a, it is a, a, a much sought after bird um, for people around that area. But this is what most people want to see, which is the Irrawaddy dolphin, which is a species that lives in both freshwater and saltwater. Uh, but here there's a small population that are always in, always in the same place, up to about 20 animals or so and you're pretty much guaranteed seeing them. So this is a major draw and it's actually a huge tourist attraction in, the, in, in that particular area. I just hope that they survive in good numbers for many years to come. Uh, in this general area, we stay at a place called Crati. Um, we're, we're back into hotels now, so we, we're using a combination of um, small hotels and also eco lodges as our accommodation, uh, and one night camping in order to get to the, the Vulture restaurant. But in general, it's very comfortable and a mixture of uh, an opportunity of eating uh, local dishes and also Western cuisine as well. We don't eat this, not normally anyway. <laughs> this is a whip scorpion, uh, which was, we saw over in the east. And once we've left the, the river, uh, Mekong uh, Basin. Uh, we'll travel further east where we hope to try and get into some of the more specialist primates such as these um, <coughs> uh, black shank du langurs which is lovely long tails uh, tend to be a species that stays high up in the trees and we're also looking to try and find the southern yellow cheek gibbons in this area as well uh, which is another very special animal that takes some finding but uh, local guys are very good. Because we're staying in eco lodges you might get a little bit of wildlife in your room such as this large tree frog which is just wonderful and there's a very poor picture of a thing called a, a, a Closses leaf warbler which has a very restricted range and has only just been discovered um, in this east side of Cambodia up against the Vietnamese border and we'll try very hard to see this and lots of other small birds which are specialities in this area. The raptors are slightly different over this side so uh, Jordan's Baza uh, calling uh, and on its, on its breeding territory and on one occasion we were very fortunate to come across the, the black eagle which is a rather stunning raptor almost like a black version of a golden eagle and very special indeed. So I'm just winding up now uh, last couple of slides um, and one bird that we will try and see before we leave uh, Cambodia in the Phnom Penh area is a Cambodian tailor bird which uh, Tim was mentioning uh, the tree creeper um, and how it's only been really recently uh, discovered and described. And this is a similar bird, a Cambodian tailor bird was thought initially just to be a common tailor bird with a, 
a slightly different uh, set of plumages, but it is a uh, it's new species in its own right, and it's already threatened. So it's only just been discovered. It's already already threatened, um, but we saw good numbers of them when we were there um, last year, and hopefully we'll see plenty of them again next year. So, um, very last slide. Um, ladies, if you are coming along on this trip, don't be too concerned about looking um, by bringing all your, your best gear and your best clothing with you. The done thing out there apparently is to wear this sort of attire for day and night. So this lady had actually look, was, was tending her sheep and her goats and these tracksuit bottoms or pyjama bottoms, I think they are, and this, this lovely bright uh, clothing is very typical of what the Cambodians wear. And uh, so don't bring your best gear, you'll be absolutely fine with, uh, with just hand-me-down stuff. So I, I'm going to sign off now, but I'd just like to sort of say um, I hope you've enjoyed the presentation. I'd love to see you out in Cambodia uh, next year. Uh, the dates are the 12th of Jan through to the 28th of Jan, and then the 2nd, 12th, and 28th of Jan through to the 13th of Feb. Um, hopefully, 2022, we'll see us in a fine, much better position than we are now. And thank you for your time. Thanks so much, Neil, and thank you to Tim for, for your very enthusiastic and fascinating talks. That's marvellous. So we're going to just take five minutes now. Um, we'll come back at 8.25, so you've got five minutes to go and top up your drinks, get some nibbles, whatever you need to do, um, and we'll kick off again in five minutes.
refreshed, I am delighted now to hand over to Matt, who's going to take us to Thailand and Taiwan. Over to you, Matt. And that's great, Kerry. Thank you very much. And a very good evening, everyone. Just make sure my screen is shared. There we go. Well, very good evening. My name is Matt. I'm an operations assistant here at Nature Trek. And I also do a bit of tour leading as well. Now, prior to joining Nature Trek this time last year, I was very fortunate to have set foot on all seven continents. And during my years of traveling, I also spent a fair bit of time in East Asia uh, with two trips to Thailand and one trip to Taiwan. So in the next 20 minutes, hopefully I'll be, hopefully I'll be able to show you the many highlights of these two fantastic bird watching destinations. So firstly, Thailand. So it involves a 12 hour direct flight from London to Bangkok. Once we land at Bangkok, we head southwest for a couple of hours to Petrobri province. Um, we spend a couple of nights there, then we divert ourselves to the northeast side of Bangkok to Kariai National Park, spend three nights here, and then we take an internal flight up, up to Chiang Mai and spend a further three, night, three nights at Doi Antonon. So the general accommodation um, across Thailand and Taiwan, I do it, I do them all together, is very comfortable accommodation and all the and all the and all the local amenities that one would need. Uh, the food as well, uh, the East Asian cuisine is probably some of the finest in the world. Uh, we also do offer vegetarian and vegan options too. So our first few days are spent in Petrobri province and the world famous Paktale salt pans. Now these are a famous site for the wintering site for thousands of waders that winter here. And our time here will be spent traveling around these salt pans in our minibus uh, to get close to the flocks to scan for further species. Uh, there are a few rare species that do occur here and over our two days hopefully we'll be able to see them. So just in this flock here these are greater and lesser sand plovers, mainly lessers, uh, but off to the right there are also some curlew sand plovers and some broadbilled sand plovers. Now other waders we should expect to find, this is a redneck stint, they're very common on the salt pans. And over to the left here, we have a tenant stint. Sometimes you see them in this country and also the long toed stint on the right. Now, marsh sand pipers are very common out on the pans. Same for spotted red shanks, uh, green shanks, great knot. But during our time, we will hopefully eventually catch up with some of the critically endangered species that spend their time at these salt pans. And one labelled here is the Asiatic Dowager, a critically endangered species that winter here in very small numbers. So hopefully we'll be able to find these in, during our time here. Now though, it, most, bird, most bird watchers come to Thailand to see probably one of the world's most iconic species of bird, and that is the critically endangered spoon-billed sandpiper. Now their population is currently around 400 pairs, and their breeding range is in northeast Siberia, up at uh, We'll have uh, around far, um, and hopefully during our time here, we should be able to get views such as this. And there's a nice little close up of its beautiful builder, an absolutely superb bird. Now, during our uh, during the afternoon or early the next morning, we'll take a small boat out into the mangroves and, and out to a sand spit. Um, along the way, we'd hope to come across the Chinese egret, another scarce bird that we hope to come across here. And as we make our way out, we shall we might have to get our feet wet slightly, and then we we'll walk for a very short time along the uh, sand spit, where we hope to come across another two more scarce waders. The first one is the Malaysian plover. Now, as the name suggests, this is normally found in Peninsula Malaysia. However, they do uh, occur in central Thailand, and here is around the northern part of its range. The white-faced plover, this is um, a recently split bird. It was thought once to be a subspecies of the Kentish plover, a very common way worldwide, but rightfully so, it is now um, its own species, and it is the white-faced plover. So this was probably one of the last species of wader we hope to encounter. During, during our time here, we should come across around 30 to 35 species of wader. Now, of course, it's not all about the waders. There are many raptors as well that are around the salt pans, um, namely eastern marsh areas, Brahmi kites, black-eared kites, but also this wonderful black bazaar. Um, 
it's roughly the size of a female sparrowhawk, but extremely striking bird. Now during the during the evenings, we hope to come across some Indian night jars just around the the accommodation. They're just a short walk as well, um, but they are very common in the winter here. So that's our time at Petra Brewery. Um, all very brief. So now we're now going to head to the northeast side of uh, Bangkok to Khao Yai National Park. Now this is one of Thailand's most famous national parks. Roughly 445 species of birds have been recorded here, but it's also exceptional for its mammals. So there's plenty of Asian elephants, white-handed gibbons, and common palm civets. And it's also a great spot to see the rarer mammals as well. Occasional clouded leopards can be found during the night, Asiatic black bears sometimes during the day, and also smooth-coated otters. Now, this is the main road that leads through the main national park, but at intervals, there are occasional footpaths that lead out into the jungle, and here we will spend the majority of our time. Now, the paths here are extremely quiet. No locals use them, so it's, you should expect to have the footpaths to yourselves. Now, Carrier is probably the number one spot to see the beautiful Great Hornbill. Its wing beats can be heard from up to one mile away, so an absolutely superb bird to see. Nice other wildlife we should hopefully come across as well. This is a Blanford's flying lizard, an exceptional reptile. And common purple sapphire are just one of the many species of butterfly we hope to find as well. Now back to the birds. Now Kaliai National Park is brilliant for its species of broadbill. Roughly five species are found here, and including this one, the cartoon character-like long-tailed broadbill. An absolute superb bird, which roam around the canopy in very large flocks. Another superb broadbill would see black and yellow broadbill. Absolutely gorgeous bird. Now, photography in Thailand is um, extremely popular and scattered around the national park here are a number of feeding stations. And occasionally they get drawn in with coral billed ground cuckoos, um, a much sought after bird in uh, Southeast Asia. And some years they're there, they're nice and easy. They're just there waiting for us. And in other years, they just absent completely. So certainly got to be lucky to see one of those. Blue pitter is another bird we hope to come across at these feeding stations. This is a, a forest dweller of the deep interior, but occasionally at these feeding stations, they can show as well as this. And also the white throated rock thrush, an absolutely beautiful bird, again, that can show up at these feeding stations and they can show as well as this. So this isn't a misleading image at all. They can show this close. Absolute gorgeous bird. As is the very common wolfing thrush. Very nice and easy. Now, Thailand is known for its pheasants, and the Siamese fireback is an absolute beauty. Um, they can be found in the forest interior along these paths, but also just along the main road of an early morning or late afternoon. And when they raise their wings, they show a beautiful golden back, hence the name. Now, as we're walking along the forest paths, we've got to keep our ears peeled as we have to listen to the rummaging around um, amongst the leaves, as normally it does, does give away the presence of a partridge, green leg partridge or barbacked partridge. But just occasionally, as this happened to me a few years ago, you may look down and there could be an eared pitter just in front of you, an absolute superb bird of the forest interior. Now to the mammals. Um, Nocturnal mammals include East Asian porcupine. They can often be, be found around the campsites nice and easily. The Asiatic black bear is an uncommon sighting at Kari National Park, and this is not expected, but they can be seen here. So if you're there, you may just get lucky. But one we do hope to see is the white-handed gibbon. Now this, uh, this beautiful species resonates its wonderful dawn chorus across the Asian rainforest. And here, you can see a baby hanging on to its mother as she's hanging around. And lastly, the Asian elephants. Again, they're quite prolific in the national park and they do show exceptionally well at times. Um, again, they can be absent, but we do take night drives in the national park as well. So hopefully uh, increase our chances of finding them. But again, I got very lucky during the day, so lovely. Okay, so after Kari National Park, we're now going to take our internal flight up to Doi Antonon National Park. Now, now as we're going so far north, 
uh, expect a completely different range of species to be seen. Now, our hotel is based just outside the entrance at the National Park, at the lower elevations. Um, so we will make our way up to the higher elevations early one morning, to the highest point in Thailand at Doyen Non, to hopefully get a view such as this. Now, the National Park is home to many waterfalls, as well as their beauty, they do also hold on to many birds. Uh, the blue whistling thrush, for example, are very common around the water here. Plumbius red starts are also equally common. The beautiful and striking white capped red start, the white tailed robin, probably the best of them all, the slaty backed fork tail. Now, Tim showed us some fork tails earlier, the white crowned. Uh, this one here, the slaty backed fork tail, is uh, just as beautiful and very much larger than our wagtails over here and very distinct in their plumage. So there's always plenty of time for lunches on our journey up and down the mountain. And got some great picnic lunches there. And during the day, we take our, we take the trails through the forest and just around the mid elevations, we hope to see the hill blue flycatcher, quite a common bird. Uh, this very scarce slaty belly teaser, we're more than often than not hear these. Um, we may obtain views such as this, but we would be very lucky to do so. Now at the very top, there is um, a boardwalk. You can just see it's on the left-hand side of the image there. And this is, this is the Summit Marsh Boardwalk. And this is home to some very scarce wintering birds that would otherwise summer in the Himalaya. And one such is the uh, dark-sided thrush, a very um, exciting bird for the twitcher um, but it is a very rare bird worldwide but not as rare is the gold sunbird an absolutely beautiful bird that can be found that found at these higher higher elevations but that's it for Thailand for now I will finish Thailand by just saying that uh, we will be extending our 10-day tour to hopefully a 16-day tour in uh, years to come so please keep an eye out for that so I'm now going to move over to Taiwan. This is a large island situated off the east coast of China, and that involves an indirect flight via, via Dubai or Hong Kong, depending on the flight times at the time. So there's Taiwan on the left. It's home to around 24 million people who mainly reside in the capital city of Taipei, which is found in the north of the country. Uh, two thirds of the country, as you can see, is mountainous. The dark green sections there are the mountains and the sandy brown are the lowlands. Now, Taiwan is the land of, of endemism. Um, 28 species of birds are endemic to the island. Um, and there's a further 50 species that are endemic subspecies. So there's a lot of allopatric speciation that happens here. So that's when the population of the same species becomes separated by geographical change. So our guide, Richard Foster, he's a, a Northern Irishman, um, extremely friendly chap. He spoke the local lingo. He's lived out in Taiwan for a very long time, and he will take you around this fantastic island to hopefully see all the endemics. So this photo of Mount Yuhan, the highest point in Taiwan, very much in the winter there. So the majority of our time, as I said, is spent in these mountains and most of the birding is actually done along the tarmac road that heads up the mountains. However, there are a few forest trails as well. And as you can see here, they're very well maintained. But this is a very gentle paced uh, trip. Um, it's, there's no hard walking at all, all slow paced, etc. Here's just a view of the surrounding area. There's plenty of tea plantations. So if you'd like your tea, Taiwan is a fantastic place to go to. So back to the birds, uh, brown shrikes are very common on the island, probably one of the commonest winter visitors you're likely to see. But of course we are here for the endemics. So one of the first endemics you are likely to see is the Taiwan Sinata babbler, an absolute gorgeous bird there. The collared finch bill, another endemic. Uh, Taiwan barbit, this fruit eating species that can be found at, found at the lower parts of the hills. And the striking vivid Niltava um, can be seen easily as we slowly head up uh, the mountains. Now earlier, Neil and Tim showed us the uh, red-billed blue magpie, which can be found on mainland Asia. Uh, but Taiwan has its own blue magpie, and it's of course named the uh, Taiwan blue magpie. And if I may say so, I think it's the most striking of all the blue magpies that are present in Asia. 
Now, as we head up into the, the mid elevations, we will start to come across many species flocks. Now, into winter, um, all these species gather together to form mixed species flocks, and these are the main three we're likely to see in these flocks. We've got the black throated tit on the right, the Japanese white eye, and the Taiwan Yuhina. Now, of course, as we go up, the views become absolutely superb. We're above the cloud level here. And this is where we start to come across the pheasants. There's two famous pheasants, endemic pheasants found on Taiwan, the Mikado and the Swinhoes. Now, this, uh, these are my friends from a few years ago photographing the Mikado pheasant just off the roadside there. So um, there's no strenuous walking to try and find these. So it's all very nice and easy. And there we go. There's a Mikado pheasant I took a photo of a few years ago. And the other pheasant, the Swinhoes pheasant, just as striking, is uh, another beauty. Now, photography in uh, Taiwan is just as popular as it is in Thailand. And here we expect to see white whiskered laughing thrushes trying to take all the seeds that have been put out for the pheasants. So, this is why all these birds are around the, are around the roadsides um, because of photographers put all the seed there for them. So, the birding is generally quite easy in the mountains. Now, as we head further up, Steersleia Steersleia chicla uh, can be found in the berry bushes, a be beautiful endemic bird, as is the yellow tit, uh, the beautiful collared bush robin, and the extremely tiny and secretive uh, Taiwan wren babbler, an absolute beauty of a bird, but being the size of a wren in these moss clad and forests, they are extremely tricky to find. So as we head further up and almost above the tree line, we start to come across many bamboo stands. And although this isn't an endemic bird, it's one mo most bird watchers want to see uh, because they are, it's highly secretive on mainland Asia. Uh, but on Taiwan, there is a very good chance to see the beautiful golden parrot bill, which live only in these bamboo stands near the top of the mountains. An absolutely gorgeous bird. So that's generally it for the mountains. As we slowly head down, we weave through the various tea plantations and we start to make our way to the uh, west coast of Taiwan. Um, and here we pass through many temples. Um, we're hoping to stop off at this one, mainly because it, there's a, a collared scopsail that lives inside the entrance. So not only you get a bit of culture, you're still, still ticking away the birds as well. So here we are on the uh, west coast. So this is a great opportunity to get your scopes out and start to scan for waders and gulls, etc. Now, many of the waders will be ones that you can see in Thailand as well. However, there are a few that are more common here in Taiwan than in Thailand. And one such is the uh, sharp-tailed sandpiper, a far East Asian species that very rarely turns up here in the UK. But the main reason for coming here is to see the beautiful black-faced spoonbills uh, this is another critically endangered species and Taiwan is by far the best place to see them in the world. And here they are just about flying away. Okay, so I'm just going to end this, uh, this presentation by this lovely photo of uh, Taipei City. Um, and just to say that if anyone does wish to extend their, their trip and wish to stay stay in the cities for a few days, and that's absolutely fine. We can easily arrange that for you. Um, so I think that's it for me. Um, I'll pass you now to uh, Paul Stanbury, but thank you very much for listening. And I hope to see you on one of our Taiwan or Thailand tours in the near future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matt. Um, just uh, bear with me one second while I quickly share my screen. Okay, well, uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much for tuning in uh, this evening. My name's Paul Stanbury, um, and I've been working for Nature Trek um, since uh, 1996, so quite a quite a while now. Um, I look after a wide, I'm an operations manager, I look after a wide range of tours um, in, in the Nature Trek office, Sub-Saharan Africa, um, cruises, a few uh, destinations in, in South America, North America, and, a, and uh, a few spots over in the in the east as well in East Asia. And tonight, I'm going to round off this evening um, with a talk on Japan. Um, and we've been running trips to Japan now um, for um, for three years. 
and uh, I was lucky enough to go on the, the, the uh, inaugural trip. Um, and it's yeah, fantastic destination, some wonderful birds, really nice um, um, scenery as well. So, of course, we're all very familiar with, uh, with where Japan is. Um, we're on the Pacific Rim of Fire here. Um, there are three main islands. We've got Hokkaido in the north, Honshu, the big island in the middle, and then Kyushu down in the, in the south. Um, and our tour, which is a 12 day tour, um, it operates in January and February time, visits all three islands. We're focusing in particular on Hokkaido um, up in the north, um, but you can also extend down to, down to Kyushu as well. Um, we fly into Tokyo um, and then, as I say, go up to Hokkaido to enjoy the cranes and the eagles and the fantastic landscapes, back down to Tokyo and then across to Nagano, uh, which is the, the famous home of the, or the home of the, the famous snow monkeys, the Japanese macaques that, uh, that bathe in the hot water springs. But our tours all start with a flight to, um, to Tokyo. Um, absolutely massive city, one of the largest in the world. 37 million people live in the, in the greater Tokyo um, area. And the great thing about Japan is it's a cultural experience as well as a wildlife experience. And you can't go to the country without enjoying some of the, the local culture. The, the people are incredibly friendly, incredibly helpful. Um, we'll have a, a local Japanese guide with us throughout the, the holiday as well as a, a UK based uh, um, a naturalist. And the Japanese guides are just so nice, so friendly. They will tell you about the Japanese uh, culture and history. Um, as well as helping us uh, around uh, around their, their wonderful country. But we spend a night in, in Tokyo um, just to relax from the long flight. Um, but we also head out into the city itself and there's the opportunity to look around at some of the, uh, the, 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 the key cultural sites in, in the city as well as doing some um, birding as well. And there are actually some, some good birding sites within fairly easy reach of, of um, Tokyo has a fantastic public transport system and some very, very reliable um, network of trains. So we hop on a train um, on the first afternoon and head out to, um, to both Kazo Rikai Park and also um, have a look at the Imperial Palace um, in, in the centre of Tokyo. And both these areas um, are great for birds as well as, as, well as interesting in, in, in their own right. The common thrush in um, in Tokyo in the winter time is the is the dusky thrush. Um, and the black birds over here they're running around on the on, on, on the grassy lawns. Um, we've um, we've got varied tits as well um, in the in in the parkland. Um, so Kazai Rinkai in particular is a fa fantastic spot. It's right on the edge of Tokyo Harbour, so you've got lots of wading birds out on the, out on the water. Um, and a variety of, of, of interesting land birds um, to look for as well. Dorian redstart is a, is a bird that winters commonly down in, in, in Japan at this time of year. Japanese white eye mentioned very tit. Out on the lakes, there are lots of, uh, sort of familiar ducks like gadwall and um, allard, but mixed in amongst those are spot billed ducks and these fan absolutely fantastic falcated duck, the uh, iridescence on the head. Um, when when, the, when the, the bird catches the sun is absolutely spectacular and they are commonly seen around um, on the moat around um, the the imperial palace so from tokyo we take a flight up to hokkaido and this is really the highlight of the of the, the holiday um, we fly into kushiro marked on on the map here and our main areas that we're going to visit are the Tusuri um, region to the north of Kushiro. This is where the Japanese red crown cranes can be found in the winter time. Uh, we based, we're based for our first part of the stay in, in a nice hotel quite close to Lake Kusaro in the uh, volcanic um, Akan uh, National Park. And we then head over to the Shiratoko Pen um, Peninsula and National Park and are based at Rausu for a couple of nights. And from here we see the Stella Sea Eagles Black instance fish hour, hopefully, and again enjoy some some wonderful um, snowy snowy landscapes, and then we're back to Kashiro to fly back to um, back to Tokyo again. 
Now, in Tokyo itself, we um, use fairly traditional um, Western style hotels, okay, normal Western style hotels that, that we get um, over here and elsewhere in the world. Up in Hokkaido, um, there are actually very few Western style hotels. So our, we, um, we use the traditional Japanese Ryokans. Um, and I mentioned that the, the, the culture of, the, of, of Japan is as important um, for a visit as, as the wildlife. And so we want to immerse you in the Japanese culture during the, during the evenings um, when you're not out looking for the, the birds and mammals. Um, and this is a typical room in a, in a Ryokan. Um, you, uh, they have the, the beds, uh, they have the table and chairs. And when you go out for your, uh, for your meal, um, the, you return and they've set up the, the bed for you um, on the floor. And it's actually remarkably comfortable. If the, these are futons, thick futons laid on, laid, laid on the floor. Of course, you need to get up and down, um, on, um, be able to get up and down on, onto the floor, but there, it is quite, quite comfortable um, um, set up. Um, and the food, again, is all part of the, of the Japanese experience. Um, and up in Hokkaido, uh, we're served very, very traditional uh, Jap Japanese food, sushi, and bento box, um, and a variety of other, other delights. But for me, one of the absolute um, culinary highlights of the trip to Japan was the strawberry and cream sandwiches. And they are essential. You can buy them in a lot of the, uh, a lot of the, the, um, the, the, the shops. And I definitely recommend um, trying one as well as the, the more traditional uh, Japanese cuisine. The scenery up in um, Hokkaido is uh, nothing less than spectacular. Um, you say we are on the Pacific Rim of Fire here, a very, very geologically active region of the of the world, um, where the Pacific Plate is is um, is um, being subducted underneath the um, the um, Asian Plate, um, and throwing up lots of volcanoes along this entire stretch um, of of coastline. Um, and in the course in the winter time, um, it's a very snowy landscape, and it really is quite a spectacular uh, place to to explore. Um, this is Lake Mashu, um, um, a, a, a collapsed volcanic caldera with its beautiful um, lake in the in the middle. And we'll visit this spot just to, so you can enjoy the scenery, occasionally eagles and some birds along the edge as well. So we're, we're enjoying the, the the landscapes as well as as the wildlife. Um, and on the edge of Lake Kushiro, most of the lake is frozen, but there's a couple of little geothermal springs along, along the lake shore. Um, and where the water's warmed, the ice melts, and the uh, hooper swans come in and winter here. Um, and I took this particular photograph with a wide angle lens. This is a place where the birds are incredibly confiding. It is a, it is a photographer's dream. I should have mentioned before that all the photographs I'm going to show you of the of the cranes and the eagles, the bigger birds, I actually took myself on the trip a couple of years ago. I've thrown in a few um, um, other other smaller birds that I haven't got photos of, but, but for a photographer, it really is the, the most uh, amazing destination. because You've got the landscapes, the light is wonderful, and the and the wildlife is is very very confiding. As well as the bigger birds, we've got some little small birds that overwinter. A lot of most of the birds do tend to leave smaller birds, leave Hokkaido, move down to warmer climates. Or well, the lovely little long-tailed tit of the, the white-headed variety occurs in Hokkaido are quite commonly seen. And especially on the feeders, a lot of the hotels and the restaurants um, hang out, uh, feeding, have little feeding stations, and the long-tailed tits and nut hatches and marsh tits come down and, and, uh, and feed. But the main bird we're looking for around the Kushiro area in the Kushiro marshes is the uh, one of the most iconic bird really of Japan, um, the Japanese uh, crane or the red crowned crane. Um, this bird was pretty much hunted to extinction uh, um, during the last century. In the beginning of the last century, they thought it pretty much thought it was extinct in, in, in Japan. Um, and then around 20 birds were found in the Kushiro marshes back in 1926. Um, and they've been protected ever since. And there's now about 950 um, or so birds um, that, are, that are resident in, in Hokkaido. And in the winter time, um, they, they're fed in, in, in several feeding areas and this attracts the birds in. Um, and it's an absolutely magical opportunity, a lovely snowy day to go and stand and watch the cranes bugling and dancing 
and um, and these birds absolutely love to dance. Red crown cranes are dancing all the time in, in February time and you can get some wonderful photographs and views of these very very majestic birds. They trumpeting um, out on the out in the fields and, uh, and and dancing and, and displaying um, to each other. Um, for me, one of the real highlights was the opportunity to visit the um, Ottawa Bridge, uh, an iconic spot in, in Hokkaido. Um, this is uh, the bridge over the Setsugari uh, River. And we go down there at first light. We try and get down there for dawn, because at this time, if you've, got an, if you've got a nice clear night, nice frosty clear night, um, the hoar frost um, on the trees and the mist rising out of the, out of the river is absolutely stunning. It admittedly was a little bit chilly. It was minus 16 when, when we got there um, at, uh, at about six o'clock uh, in the morning, but it was well worth the, um, the, the chilly toes just to see the, the light change and the sun come up and this amazing um, um, picture um, in front of you. So about 100 or so red crowned cranes, which normally uh, roost um, during the night on, on the river here. If you're very lucky, um, a little bit later on, the birds will take off, well, they will leave at some point, whether they head away from you or towards you is a matter of luck. We were very fortunate on the day I was there and we waited around, waited for most of the other people to go and all the cranes lifted up off the river and flew right over our heads and out to feed. And then after enjoying um, the cranes and the landscapes of central Hokkaido, we move over to the coast, to the Shiratoko Peninsula, um, to uh, quite an unassuming little fishing village called uh, Rausu. Um, and um, as you're driving up the road, the coast road, some Shibetsu up to Rausu, you start to see a few Stella sea eagles and a few white-tailed eagles. And then you see a few more, and then you see a few more, and then you see more and more. And by the time you reach Rausu, the trees are just laden with, with, with Stellas and, and white-tailed eagles. There's over a thousand Stellas eagles come down to Rausu and this stretch of coastline every, every winter time. Um, and so one of, the, one of the great ornithological spectacles really anywhere in the world. And these birds breed up a little bit further north, up in, up in Russia, up around Kamchatka and the, around the Sea of Kohosk. Um, but in the winter time, they come down to northern Japan, in particular around Rausu, to scavenge on, on fish from the fishing boat. And these days, to take to take fish from the from from the tourist boats as well. Uh, and we'll take you out on a on a couple of boat trips um, from from Rausu Harbour. Um, when you when you when you arrive, we'll first go out on a short trip about uh, about an a, um, an hour or so. And they this is it's a small boat. Just head out from the harbour. Um, it might be snowy, might be sunny. Hopefully, you get a, a mix of the two. Actually, the birds look absolutely even more uh, majestic in a in a in a. And then, so you head out just a little way from the harbour, not not very far, literally within a stone's throw of the harbour itself. Um, and then the guy on board the boat will throw fish overboard in a similar fashion to what they do up in Scotland with the with the white-tailed eagles. But here, you've got Stella's eagles diving down right next to the boat, catching the fish out of the water. The problem I had with taking these photos with the birds were just too close. I had a 300 mil lens on the camera and was just getting a bit of a wing and a bit of a, a bit of a foot or a bit of a leg at some points at quite a few occasions. So again, photography opportunities, um, absolutely amazing. And it's just incredible to watch these birds diving down, right down next to the boat and plucking the fish out of the water. And as well as the Stellas, you've got plenty of white-tailed eagles as well. Um, and then depending on what the ice conditions are like, um, they, the, the boat will, 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 will end its little trip just by going up against, really against the, against the sea wall in Rausu. Um, and here you're eye to eye with the Stellas eagles. They have got very, very little fear of, of people at all. Um, and again, just amazing photographic opportunities. I counted over a hundred, nearly 140, I think it was Stella's eagles, um, lined up along along the wall at Rausu when, when we were there, um, as well as the white-tailed eagles as well. And so the white-tailed white eagles to us are a massive bird. You know, they're called, we call them flying barn doors, but they're dwarfed when they're, they're sat next to the amazing Stella's sea eagle. These are absolutely incredible 
majestic and spectacular birds to see. And you can get to say, some really close views of them eye to eye with these birds and just they just the guys on the boat throw a few fish onto the seawall and within seconds you're, you're surrounded by these uh, by the eagles um and then so we got two opportunities to uh, to see stella's eagles so in the first evening first afternoon we go out for a, a quick trip then we go out again the following morning and hopefully head out to find the pack ice the pack ice has come down in um, at this time of year, the boat will go out and then you'll see the Stellas out on the pack ice as the as the sun rises. But we'll also take you out exploring other areas around um, around Hokkaido, looking for uh, birds out on the sea, such as long-tailed duck. Um, there are plenty of uh, harlequin ducks as well along the coastline here. It has to be one of the most spectacular of, of all the all the ducks. Um, and also out at sea, you'll also hopefully get to see maybe ancient murlet, uh, um, spectacle guillemot and a, a variety of other species too. But the other key bird we want to see at Rausu is a uh, nocturnal species, the uh, Black Instance fish owl, one of the largest and rarest owls in the world. And there's a there's a hide, there's, there's a hide just to the north of Rausu, um, quite a quite a basic place, um, but um, there's a lady there who puts fish out on a little pond each evening. Um, and with a, with a degree of luck and some de half decent weather, you've got a good chance of seeing a Blackinson's fish owl coming down and taking the fish. But you actually have two opportunities for, for Blackinson's on this, this particular trip. If you're unlucky enough to miss them at Rausu, then on the final night, we stay at a, um, at a, at a, at a lovely um, um, Japanese inn at, um, at a place called... Um, just forgotten the name of it, um, Daichi, that's right, sorry, Daichi, Daichi Onsen. Um, and it's a really lovely place. It's actually one of the few um, hotels uh, around the area with proper Western style rooms, so proper beds, proper showers and toilets, etc. cetera. Um, and they also have their own Black Instance fish owl and they put fish out again, just outside the window. And this photograph was taken with a standard lens from just inside the um, um, the, the guest house and the owl just landed within a few feet of, of the window. Um, and out on the river itself, there's also brown dipper. You might see crested kingfisher. We were very lucky as, as well to see solitary snipe on the top of the visit. Uh, um, I made that's one of the rarest, most uh, um, elusive of, of the snipe um, in the world. Um, and in the morning, um, had red fox come out too. And um, here they're because the temperature is so low, they're um, very, um, very, very thick, um, thick coats. Um, and up until a couple of years ago, there were also Japanese sable regularly coming to the feeders. Um, I, I don't think they were seen uh, last year in, in 2020. Of course, in 2021, we've not been able to operate any trips to Japan. So I don't know whether they're still around. Hopefully they'll be back again in, in 22. Then we're back to Tokyo and we're hopping on a bullet train um, for the 90 minute, 300 kilometer, kilometer an hour journey to, to Nagano. Um, and just about an hour from Nagano up into the hills is the Jigo Gadani, what they call the Jigo Gadani Monkey Park, um, which is um, uh, translated as, as Hell Valley. And it's here that the uh, Japanese macaques, the so-called snow monkeys, come down and bathe in the hot springs. Um, and uh, that these the monkeys used to the macaques used to bathe in the hot springs um, um, that were set up for a hotel a little further down the valley, but they became a bit of a nuisance. Um, so they've created their own private little hot spring a bit further up the river. And if the temperature is very low, it has to be typically below freezing for the for the macaques to want to go into the into the hot springs. But if you're fortunate and the temperature is very low, you can see these amazing animals bathing in the in in the water and if they're not there'll be plenty of them around this is the most northerly non-human primate and lives further north than any other species of primate and, it, and it's a, uh, another another highlight of a, of a trip down here and there's a few birds around as well we'll also on the way back from Nagano we'll stop at a place called Kurosawa and explore some of the um the the deciduous forests here. Um, quite often, Japanese wax wings feeding on uh, feeding on on the mistletoe. Uh, we've had a very lucky group that even saw copper pheasant a couple of years ago. A little bit of culture as well. The Zenkoji Temple is in in Nagano. Um, this is home to the first Buddhist statue that was brought to Japan in the sixth century. So we will show you some of the some of the culture as well as the wildlife. 
And that's so that's sort of the, the standard tour, the standard 12 day tour. And then we return back to Tokyo and we fly home from there. But if you want to extend your, your, your time in in Japan, we can do lots of tailored extensions. But our most popular one is down to the southern island of Kyushu and we fly into Kumamoto travel down to Yachishiro for a bit of coastal bird watching, black-faced spoonbills and uh, saunders gulls, some other nice birds. We stay at Izumi for three nights while we look for the, um, the, the wintering cranes down here, and then finally fly out of Kagoshima um, at the end. And our main reason for coming down here is to see, is to enjoy more cranes. Um, here we've got two main species. Um, the hooded crane and the white naped crane and they winter here and they breed up in, in northern Asia and winter down in, in uh, southern Japan. You know, over 15,000 hooded cranes winter here so it's an absolutely amazing spectacle. I will take you to the crane centre, you go up onto the roof first thing in the morning and wave after wave after wave of hooded cranes come in to, to feed on the potatoes and other food that they, they put out in the fields below. And within these, they are mixed in smaller numbers of the very majestic white naped crane. Um, but as well as these two, they often get a few sandhill canes, a few common cranes. If you're very lucky, maybe even the occasional Siberian crane as well. And since it's so much milder down in Kyushu than us, us up in Hokkaido, there are a lot more wintering birds out here and the diversity of bird life is much greater than further north. This is a, a part of a huge flock of brambling that we, that we had um, on my trip. Mixed in amongst them were um, oriental green finches, chestnut-eared buntings, um, little buntings, rustic buntings. There's a great variety of different things to enjoy. Um, this is a, 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 a blue rock thrush and down here they have a chestnut belly. Um, and we take you up to a, to a lovely area of woodland uh, called the Kogawa Dam, um, where we're birding around the, the forest. But out on the dam, you're going to see some genuine mandarin ducks and really wild mandarin ducks, um, as, uh, similar to the, um, to the harlequin, again, one of the most spectacular of the world's duck species. In the forest around the edge, there are plenty of red flank blue tails and, and other species to look out for. Um, and say that's a three night extension that takes you down to down to Kyushu. Um, there's um, lots of other opportunities we can do as well. Uh, we do have people who want to, to do a more cultural extension and we, and we can do that. Um, so, so there's a wide variety of different options to, to look out for. So I'll end my my talk there and to say thank you very much uh, for, for listening. If you have any questions at all then please do not hesitate to, to, to let us know or either type them up or uh, send me an email or, or give, give an age track office a call. I will pass back to Kerry now um, for the Q&A session so thank you very much. Thank you very much Paul and thanks to Matt before you. Um, I've learned a lot this evening and I hope everyone's been very inspired to travel to the Far East once it's it's safe to do so once again. Um, so hopefully Neil and Tim will rejoin us. Uh, webcams and their microphones fired up. Um, so if you have got a question for us, then um, just pop it into the question answer box. We'll keep an eye on it and anything that comes in, we'll, we'll come back to you. Um, whilst we're waiting for anyone to, to ponder their questions, there's a few recurring themes that I've seen in the, um, in the question answer and on the chat. Um, have we got Neil and Tim? Are you both back? Um, I, I, I'm here, but I, um, it says that you've switched off my camera, oh, so sorry. I can't be. Yeah. I've asked you, I, I've now asked you to restart it. Let's see if that works. There we, there we go. I turned you both off. <laughs> <laughs> so Tim, um, there have been a few questions on China, and thank you for typing some answers as we've gone along, but I think others may also have the same sorts of questions as there was a bit of a theme there. So. Um, the three main things I think we've found out were, the, is altitude a problem? What's the food like? And is it cold? Are you able to answer that, that little trio for us to kick things off? Yeah, sure. Uh, I suffer from altitude sickness if I go from really low altitude rapidly to high altitude. But because in China, we, um, we just gradually increase by increments, our bodies acclimatized to it. And even at 4,600 meters, I've never really had a problem and neither has anybody else. They do actually have oxygen uh, canisters and masks in the hotel rooms at high altitude, but nobody's ever needed them. Everybody Everybody seems to uh, cope really well. Um, as for the food, we um, uh, 
they usually uh, order a banquet that uh, uh, with a variety of dishes. So if people want to choose hot and spicy, they can. If people want to choose bland things, they can. You know, there's lots of vegetarian dishes and scrambled eggy, tomatoey type dishes, as well as the usual sweet and sour and and hot spicy stuff. But um, so we usually find um, you know I, not not really a problem with the food. And as for cold, um, I also I've actually felt much colder in Yorkshire. Um, Rura guy up on the Tibetan plateau can get cold, but we're all ready for it with, uh, you know, padded trousers and, and, and warm clothes. And we can always go inside the vehicle if you do get, you know, very warm. And when we're walking about, you keep yourself warm. So, uh, uh, but Rura guy is the only place where I would say that it, it does get quite cold. The rest of it is absolutely fine. Perfect. Thank you, Tim. I, I like this. there's a comment here saying someone they thought Cambodia was just edging it, but then Paul mentioned strawberry and cream sandwiches in Japan. So <laughs> uh, you, you've got to try it. It's, there's, there's nothing like it. <laughs> Highlight of the trip. Sounds good to me. Um, a question for you, Neil. Are there chances of seeing any pitters in Cambodia? Yeah, there's a whole range of pitters which are there and we hear them all the time. And our local guides uh, almost assure us of seeing them. But I have to say that we were pretty unlucky on the uh, on our trips last year. I think we only saw about three. Uh, we actually found a dead one as well. Can you can you believe? But um, they're there. We hear them an awful lot. Um, it, but it's one of those birds where you just need a little bit of luck. If you get a place like Thailand, of course, then and China, um, you do find these sort of feeding stations. But at the moment, Cambodia hasn't quite gone down that road yet. But we're hoping that um, in the next couple of years, we can probably set up some feeding stations to actually properly see these birds because they are just wonderful. Perfect. Um... Paul, there was a question about whether there's any warmer trips to China. Coldness. <laughs> <laughs> Let me putting people off, even though Tim's now reassured us that it's colder in Yorkshire. Um, well, we, uh, we, we do an April trip um, as well that, that starts with the Terracotta Warriors in Xi'an and then and ends up in, in Sichuan um, at, the, at the end. I'm also looking into some other, other trips as well. So once we're we're through dear old uh, COVID and we're back to some sort of nor normality. I'm going to be bringing in some more um, China trips, one that's going to focus on the, on the pheasants. So we'll go and search out some of those wonderful pheasants that Tim showed you earlier um, and hopefully maybe a botany focus one as well. So yeah, it's, it's bait, bait. Yeah, watch, watch this space. There will be more. Sounds great. And I've just seen a comment from Tim Appleton. Hello, Tim. Fab presentation, Paul. Please can we book? Yes, Tim, of course you can. <laughs> Probably this year is not it. I mean, these trips go in, in Feb, don't they, Paul? So this year is not happening. But no, no, 2022, but we've still got... Where it's going to be at, yeah. Keeping our fingers firmly crossed for, for next year. Um, anything else? Oh, another same question then, Paul. Any warmer trips to Japan? Don't want to miss the cranes, but I'm not a great fan of extreme cold. Again, yes, and it plans in the future, not at the moment, but I, I want to do a trip, for example, that takes in the birds and the and the cherry blossom uh, blooming in, in, in Japan. Um, there's some, some great wildlife up in Hokkaido in the summertime I'd like to do. Um, so, yeah, lots, lots of plans in the pipeline, but not quite yet. So probably 20, 23 and beyond. Yeah, and I would just add that um, we launch all of our new tours in our um, newsletters, either online or in our newsletters, so you don't have to wait for the giant brochure to plummet onto your doormat again. Um, anything new tends to get a bit lost in there, so we still send out newsletters, and we have been doing it for last year still, um, three or four times a year, um, three times a year, and all of our new tours will go in those, so um, if you just make sure you're on our mailing list and that you're receiving those, then you'll see any, any new tours like that that we launch, they'll always be in there, um, and sending out on eShops as well. Um, thanks, Paul. I would, oh, sorry, I would just say that, that Japan in the winter is not as cold as you might think. You know, it does, is it, it as cold as Yorkshire? It, it's it's <laughs> cold as Yorkshire, from what I understand. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a very dry cold. As long as you've got plenty of um, the, the right gear, you'll you be absolutely fine. During the, the middle of the day, the temperatures are hovering around zero, one, two degrees below. Um, but yeah, we have the right clothing and it's absolutely, absolutely fine. I lived in Yorkshire for a few years and it was during the big freeze year. So to me, it is a really cold place. <laughs> it is. <laughs> it is very um, cold. <laughs> so a question from Tony. To the panel, I would say, 
where is the single best trip to see wintering Siberian birds alongside the local and endemic birds? You can fight it out for your answer for this one. Um, okay, well, I think I'll start with this. Um, yes, yeah, so I think most of the Southeast, the Southeast Asian countries are brilliant for finding these winter sites. Uh, Thailand, for example, is uh, great in the mountains, but also in the lowlands uh, to find these birds. But in Taiwan as well, um, find things like, like island thrushes and blue tails, stub tails, etc. And uh, so it just basically depends where you go. As long as, the, as long as the habitat isn't too thick, and um, we're more likely to find these wintering sides. Don't know what, what you guys think. Uh, I, I would agree with that, Matt. Yeah, I'd, uh, Thailand's probably the best place that I've seen for uh, wintering sides um, and, uh, and uh, Malaysia next to it. Uh, but in China, we get lots of uh, that. I mean, dusky thrushes and Nauman thrushes, we get black-throated and red-throated thrushes. red flanked blue tails are one of the commonest birds there. And, uh, and you know, various of the Philosophus warblers. So, and that's in cold China at some altitude. So, uh, yeah. Thank you very much all. Um, probably one for you, Matt. Martin asks, what additional places do you plan to visit on your longer Thai tour? Ah, uh, yeah, so we are hoping to get to the Kang Kretchen National Park, which is further southwest from Bangkok. And then after that, we're gonna head up the, uh, the western side um, and try and get as far north as Doi Lang. So the number one site for giant nuthatch. Um, as well as Hume's pheasants and a few other speci specialities of that area. So that's where we are, we're aiming to get to. Um, another question whilst we're on you, I think, um, is there time to visit the National Palace Museum in Taipei from when some years ago and had the most spectacular collections? I'm so assuming okay. is, is, that, is, there time? is there time to visit the National Palace Museum in Taipei? Is that? Yeah, so not on the... Uh, not on the general 10 day tour, so you can have yeah. an extension if you wish, yeah, which yeah. is very easy to sort. Almost any of our tours, if you want to add an extra day here or there, at the start or at the end, obviously mid tour is quite tricky, um, but at the start or the end to, to do that sort of thing, then it's no problem where you can still arrange your flights and just fly out a day early or back a day late, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, Paul, I sort of know the answer to this one, but I'm gonna hand it over to you anyway. Uh, I don't know the answer totally. Do you run trips to China for the amazing flowers? We have done, is that right? We have done. Um, we are. We don't at the moment, but again, it is in. It is in the pipeline. It's a trip I want to bring back. The chap who used to do our China flora trip uh, retired and disappeared. So we need to find another guy over there, lady or guy who who knows their plants, knows where to go. So yeah, I'm I'm, I'm looking and hoping that we'll, we'll do a, a, a China botany trip in the not too distant future. Perfect. Um, and a question in the chat from Judith, what's the best time of year to see the golden stub-nosed monkey in China? Um, when we go, because uh, when there aren't many leaves on the trees, that's when you can see them, uh, but they're at very low density and they are quite difficult to find. But uh, our local guides have started using uh, thermal images, which does um, um, stack the odds in your favour remarkably because you can just glance up at a, a hillside and, oh yes, I've got some registrations here, gets the telescope out and uh, finds them and then we can try and get a bit closer to them um, so uh, but yeah winter when the leaves aren't on the trees is definitely when I would want him to be going if that if that was the main thing but they are difficult you know I, I, I said they're a real prize of Tangier I've, I've been three times and I've seen them on two of the trips but we did miss them on one despite putting in hours of searching yeah um, I've just seen a comment back to the thermal, um, to the weather again. Um, Sharon says um, in the chat, I didn't find Japan too cold, just need thermals. I think that's <laughs> often the way. As long as you're prepared for these things and dressed appropriately, it's all good. Um, question popped in from Dave. Are there any butterfly orientated trips possible in any of these countries? In uh, Cambodia, no. it's still, still early days yet. Yeah. Going where you can hear me. 
Yeah, we can hear you, Neil. Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah, I mean, I mean, all I'll say is I, I'm not a lepidopterist, but uh, Cambodia is uh, absolutely amazing for butterflies. I mean, we just had to keep walking past them because there were just so many, they're almost getting in the way. Um, Lao to the north is very similar as well, but at the moment I'm not aware that we we're actually running any tours associated with that. Yeah, I think that's probably about right. I, yeah, yeah. Nothing. There's not anything specific. Obviously, there's lots to see, and I, I don't know if we have a you know a, a local butterfly expert or anyone that we can um, work with. But yeah, watch this yeah. space. I guess. Yeah, I think that's the main issue there, Kerry. That yeah. we just don't have the yeah. local words. Yeah. 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 Sadly. <laughs> um, perfect. Oh, I'm having a little scroll back. I can't see any more questions. Anyone's got them? We've got a few more minutes, so do you feel free to. Send anything else in? Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, Sharon also said exactly two years ago, I was on the Wild Winter, Wild Japan and Winter trip. It was amazing. Thanks, Paul, for the reviving and happy memories. That's what this is all about, thinking about where we've been, where we can still go, and we're all at home on a cold February evening. Um, right, well, I think we're probably about there. Um, if there are, you will, oh, 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 it's about to wrap up. I won't. Question from Kate, do we see spoon-billed sandpiper on every trip? Yep, so so far we have had 100% success rate with spoon-billed sandpiper. Um, and with their population increasing as well, um, we hope to continue that trend. Um, but they're not easy. You know, you do have to spend quite a bit of time searching for all the redneck stints, etc., to try and glimpse the spoon-billed sand. But um, yep, fingers crossed that trend shall continue. And of course, Paul runs a trip periodically to Siberia where you actually see them on the nesting grounds. Mm. So, um, yeah, you see them with a lovely red uh, uh, throat and uh, sitting on the nest. Brilliant. Which, which Tim often leads as well. So, um, <laughs> join Tim in Siberia in 22. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, it's a sort of follow up. I'm not quite, quite sure exactly what. Um, Tim means saying, what is, seriously, <laughs> what is the lead time, for example, for when the Japan trip would happen? I don't know if that's, um, we're talking about new ones or the existing ones, or if we wanted to book for next I, year. I, I, I assumed he was meaning uh, with COVID, when, when would think, you know that uh, when the next Japan trip was happening so that they've got time to prepare? That's what yeah, I read. I think, I mean, we're, we're taking bookings, obviously, now for next year. The majority of bookings that we have coming in since sending our brochure out are for 2022. Um, and for later this year as well, you know, we're not obviously getting many bookings at all for this spring. Um, it's looking not great at the moment, but um, so bookings really, we're looking at later this year and um, a lot coming in for next year. So in terms of availability, um, you can just ask us in the office to check for you, um, pop on the website. If if on our website, the availability for a tour says yes, then there's a good amount of space. And once it starts counting down from 6543, then that's the actual number of spaces on the tour left. So that's one thing to factor in, people are still booking. Um, and then in terms of, of COVID, it really is just sit tight and wait and see. Um, we just we just don't know at the moment how fast, I mean, our vaccination programme is progressing quickly compared to the world. Um, how the rest of the world progresses, we don't know. Um, and how travel corridors and um, quarantines and passports and all sorts of things will, will pan out in time. Um, hopefully as the months go by now, it's gonna get a lot clearer. Um, I just reassure you by saying that if you do book on one of our nature check tours and we are not able to run it for any of those reasons, we, we can't deliver the itinerary that you've booked. Um, if we can't get you there, if the government's advising us travel, um, any of those reasons, then you are entitled to a full refund or to rebook your place. So there isn't a risk attached to that. Um, if we can't operate your tour, then, then we'll refund you. Um, but yeah, we'll just keep our fingers crossed for next year and at least this year and see what happens really. Um, Right. Any trip? Oh, do we offer any trips with more walking? I don't know if we've discussed the walking content in the ones we've covered just now. Anyone want to take that one? Maybe Paul? Um, there's not that much walking on the Japan trip because yeah. um, it's, it's, it's middle of the winter, deep snow all around. Can we do it? We do short walks, a bit more walking down in Kyushu where it's that, that much milder, but it's it, yeah, it, it's it's not an enormous amount of walking on, on that particular tour. You probably do more walking, I would imagine, on the Thailand or Taiwan uh, tours, or maybe Tim's China trip. 
we, we do quite a bit on the China trip, um, but uh, yeah, at certain times there's a lot of sort of standing about scanning. But we usually, yeah, we usually get a bit of a, a good walking most days. And because we do uh, early mornings for wildlife and late evenings for lamping, there's often a bit of downtime during the day. And then there's, you know, ample chance for you to go off walking on your own, really, if uh, uh, locally. There's all set out trails and things. You can't get lost. But uh, uh, so there's a bit of personal walking is possible as well. Yeah, I'd say for Thailand and and Taiwan. Uh, Taiwan, there's not much walking at all. Um, mainly just walking up and down the same tarmac road and a few forest trails. In Thailand, uh, there is more walking. Um, but again, the forest trails are rather limited. There's um, at Karyai National Park, where I mentioned, that's where the most walking will take place, roughly three or four miles a day, I would say, at the very most. Yeah. I think for, for Cambodia, uh, we're talking like about uh, couple of miles a day on most days um, but it's often very very warm so we tend to do our walking first thing in the morning and again in the evening and it's one of those countries where really you need to simply uh, remain static to see the best of the stuff but yeah we do a couple of miles most days um, but just avoiding the, the hot times. Perfect thanks all. Um, and a question from Alison. Hi Alison. Um, how many people do you take on the China trip and when exactly does it go? Um, Paul or Tim? Um, uh, I'm try uh, Paul may be able to help me with exact numbers, but they've got special rules in China that if you have a, um, uh, a, a if it's an official group with a minibus, you have to have an official government guide with you that you pay for, and they don't like you going doing what you want to do. So the way in which we organise it is we have uh, two big cars, and, uh, and and we we run two cars in parallel uh, uh, with. Uh, Sid drives one and usually his brother-in-law drives the other, which means that we're totally in control. So they're pretty small groups. It's uh, one, two, three. Uh, uh, is it about six or seven, Paul, that come with us on China? No, I, think, I think it's it's eight, including you. So I think seven, seven yeah. members. Plus se, se, yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, um, so small, small groups. And uh, uh, because of that, everybody sees everything as well. I've, uh, I don't remember ever you know any major thing anybody missing because we're all there in a small group all seeing stuff so uh, it's good um yeah and, and they run october november early december so when, when tim said when the when the red pandas are up in the up in the trees uh, feeding on the fruit yeah the red pandas are the time critical one uh, yeah you just have to get that little time window but the autumn's fine okay brilliant thank you everyone um, so we're just about out of time, so I would like to take this opportunity to thank all of our wonderful presenters this evening for very inspiring talks. Um, so thanks to Tim and Neil for joining us, um, images, and obviously Paul and Matt from the office. Um, if you've missed any of our previous presentation evenings, um, then they're all available online to watch. You can pop onto our website, just click on the big link from the homepage, um, and then you can just watch them using the password. Um, any any other places that you fancy going to, have a quick look. Um, we're always happy to receive your feedback. We love hearing from you afterwards. So if you've got any comments, any suggestions, any requests for future talks, then um, info at naturetrek.co.uk is where to find us. Um, if you would like to book a Nature Trek speaker for your own um, club or society, if you're a member of an RSP group or the likes, then we offer three talks to, to local natural history societies. So again, you can pop on our website, have a look at what's on offer and get in touch if something appeals and we can line someone up on Zoom for you over the next few months and fingers crossed back in person um, before too long. So we'll stay on just for another minute or so, just in case there are any very last minute questions, just pop them in, in the question answer. Um, but otherwise, um, look after yourselves, everyone. And thank you very much for joining us and good night. Yeah, good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night.